Hello there. This is Venkat Subramanyam. Welcome to the Art of Simplicity. I'm going to talk about something we deal with every single day. Complexity around us and how can we move towards simplicity. Let me start by mentioning something we carry with us every single day, which is, of course, our brain. It's one of the most complex things in the world. We all have a touch of genius. We come up with creative things. We often like, gosh, how did you even think about it? Well, it's the same brain that actually also leads into analysis paralysis on all the confusion we often carry with it. So how is it that the same brain, which is so capable, also leads to creating things that are complex? Well, I often talk to my children about Schrodinger's cat. Well, Schrodinger had this thought experiment of a cat stuck in a box. You can't see through, you cannot hear, and there's a vial in it. And in his experiment, he says that a cat is both dead and alive at the same time. Well, I'm going to say that simplicity is like Schrodinger's cat. Well, we'll get to that a little later. But when it comes to simplicity versus complexity, how do we really make things simple? As Confucius says, life is really simple, but we insist on making it really complicated. But the question I want to ask is, why? Why do we want to make things really complicated? Let's admit it. One of the reasons we like to make things complex is it feels good. Well, it feels good to create complex things because we feel we are important. You show your design to somebody and they say, gosh, this is simple. I can understand very easily. Maybe we feel a little let down. Give it to me. I'll come back the next day, maybe adding a little bit more to it. Well, we go home and tell our parents what we do. And they say, oh my gosh, I don't understand anything you said. I knew one day you'll grow up to be brilliant and really amazing. Well, we tend to really value complexity and we should really be going in the opposite direction. And if you ever doubt it, talk to those interns that come back to campus from the, the industry. They often say, the people I work with in the summer are brilliant. I understood nothing of what they do. But the point really is, that's not what we should really favor. And yet, in our societies, we tend to give importance and maybe credibility to complexity than we should for simplicity. Well, remember the wise words of Einstein. He said, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And the most important words for me is that word, lot of courage. Well, courage is something that's essential, I think, because we got to be able to stand up in front of those people and defend and say, I do want to create something simple, don't want to get dragged into the complexities that we often do. But here's the problem, though. Most of us cannot recognize what is simple. If simple was sitting next to us on the bus or a train, can we even recognize it? So how do we really move towards simplicity? Well, in my experience, and I'm sure you probably would agree with it, is most of us can say we want to create something simple, but we cannot really identify simplicity so easily. So maybe we can try a different approach. Why don't we identify what is not simple? And maybe if we can, maybe we can avoid those and maybe what's left is simple. Well, let's start with the very first one that comes to my mind. So what is not simple? Well, simple is not clever. Now, come on, come on. Everybody has created something clever, isn't it? And we all do. But part of the reason is, like I said, it feels really good. Well, I learned my hard lesson with an experience. A client had asked us to implement a certain feature, and I looked at it and said to myself, oh, I can do this in 10 minutes, but I don't want to solve the problem. I want to solve the mother of all problems. So I spent an hour implementing the solution, and when I finished, I had an out-of-body experience. Venkit got up and hugged me and said, you're amazing. It felt really good solving a meta problem than solving the problem itself, solving the mother of all problems. Well, a few weeks went by and I got an email from the client saying something terribly has gone wrong in production. I looked at it, immediately responded saying, I'm on it, I'll fix it. They said, well, we know you can fix it because you're good. 
I said, no, no, I'm going to fix it not because I'm good. I'm going to fix it because I'm the one who caused it. Well, I learned the lesson the hard way. And what did I do? I rolled back the change I made and put in that 10 minute solution, a simple one. Never heard back from them since about that particular problem. Well, I learned the lesson the hard way. These days when I sit and write code, my little brain says, this is clever. I delete it and I start over. I want to favor simplicity, not cleverness. So the point really is we all have seen brilliant solutions, clever solutions, but it can take a lot of effort to understand, sometimes to maintain it, and sometimes it can even lead to problems. Well, let's look at one example here. Notice this is the definition of Java's enum, class enum, e extends enum e. Hmm. Oh, that sound you just heard? That's your brain throwing an exception. That clearly is complex. We cannot say that's simple. Often, when I go to client sites, they ask me, how do we obfuscate the code? And I often tell them, why do you need obfuscation? Programmers create self-obfuscated code naturally. They themselves cannot understand the code a few weeks from now. Well, this can get really carried over. Remember how people said in object-oriented programming that the code models a real world? Well, let's come back to that and talk about it in a minute. Well, here is another piece of code I ran into. Notice in square root, gosh, what does it do? It takes a float x. I don't know what x means, but here's the good news. We got half of it in the first line, x half. And don't tell me you don't understand the line number three or four. Isn't that beautiful, brilliant, and clever? But here's the best part of this function. We don't know what x is, but doesn't matter. We return it in the end. How do you reason with the code like this? Or this person who took this or oh, oh, modeling to the extreme, after all, if the code models a real world, shouldn't it look like the real world? This person was creating apparently a flight simulator and wrote the code like this. My question often time is, where are the adults when somebody is writing code that's complex and hard to maintain? Well, the next thing here is, not only is a simple code not clever, a simple code is not necessarily familiar. Well, we as human beings often get into this trap. We confuse what's familiar with what is simple. Well, what is familiar is common. We have seen it many, many times, but that doesn't mean it actually is simple. It could actually be complex, but we feel comfortable because we've seen it a lot of times. Something that's not familiar may actually be simple or complex, but we cannot make a decision about it after all. Well, I might ask the question, what is this? And when I'm speaking in front of audience, often somebody says, that means simple. Well, actually I looked up on Google and it said it's actually simple, even more uncomplicated, casual and common. Now, obviously this is very common for somebody who knows it and maybe looks complex for those who don't understand those language and symbols and notations. But the point really is, we can think of complexity versus familiarity versus simplicity, but we cannot evaluate the merits of something until we are familiar with it. So let's take a look at an example right here really quickly. Let's say we have a string right in here of, let's say, names is equal to, oh, let's say list of, we'll create some names over here. So what if the question given to us is, to really take the names which are of length four and print them comma separated. How would we do this? Well, we could try, for example, for, and we could say string name coming from names after all. And we could say if name dot equals, and then of course, in this case, name dot length is equal to, and we can then say is equal to four, then we could simply say output the given name. Well, clearly we want this comma separated so we could try that and we know what they really meant was to have them on the same line. But wait a minute, there's a silly comma in the end. How do we get rid of it? Well, it turns out everyone has seen this problem before, isn't it? And it turns out this is not easy to solve at all and we could waste a lot of time. A simple problem, but unfortunately not a simple solution. So as it turns out, 
what can we do to make this really easy and simple to solve? Well, here is where we may be looking at something that's not as familiar to a number of programmers, but turns out to be really simple. So for example, we can say names, in this case, we want to output names.stream an internal iterator. We could say filter given a name. We want to get the name, name dot length, if you will. And then we could say the length of this name is equal to, let's say in this case, four characters long. And then we could say a dot collect. And we could ask it to collect by joining using a comma. Now, this comes from the collector's uh, utility, and we can simply use that in the code right here. And without much effort, we are able to get the code implemented. Very simple, given all the names, get me the names which are of length four, and collect them by joining with a comma. Well, as we can see in this case, it's a simple problem, but the imperative solution was not really that simple. But the functional solution is unfamiliar to a number of developers. For example, I worked on imperative style for a few decades before I picked up imp uh, functional style. And that was really hard journey for me because of uh, uh, not, me not being familiar with it. But it turns out we always tend to confuse familiar with simple. A lot of us are familiar with imperative style, but turns out the declarative style is actually simple because it has fewer moving parts in it. Well, simple is also not over-engineered. We all have created solutions like that Rube Goldberg machine that becomes really hard to maintain, and we should really focus on avoiding unnecessary details and over-engineering in our solutions. And finally, I would say simple is not terse. And we often try to like write code which is really terse and hard to understand. I set apart two words, concise versus terse. Concise is short and easy to understand. Terse is short and willing to hurt us and can become really hard to maintain. For example, this is something I saw at a client site where these variables didn't have any meaning to the programmer who is reading the code and was complaining that it was really hard to understand. That's an example of being terse. Similarly, in this unit test, we could say this is verbose, but unfortunately, the alternative we used in the past was not really concise. It was actually terse. The reason is this particular terse uh, test could actually pass for the wrong reasons. So I would rather write the verbose code like this, or I might use a more recent lambda expressions and assert throws to really implement it, which brings conciseness instead of terseness. This test will only pass for the right reasons. So again, simple is not terse, and we need to really keep our focus on. So don't confuse terseness with conciseness and simpleness. So we talked about simple not being familiar, not being clever, not being over-engineered, and not being terse also. And as Tony Hurst said, there are two ways of constructing a software design. One is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies, and the other is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. So we talked about what are the things that could be defined as being not simple. But it wouldn't be really ni nice to end this talk without giving a few ideas about maybe what actually is simple. So let's take a stab at a few things that can point us towards simplicity. Well, the first thing is simple is something that helps us to keep our focus. Well, there's one thing that's the most valuable in this world today, which is people's attention. I hope I have your attention right now, but how do we really keep our focus? Well, imagine we are working on a particular program and we're not sure what API to call. So maybe we decide to search for it. Well, how do we go about searching for it? Let's give it a try. Let's go here and do a quick search, maybe using Yahoo. Oh, look at that. Having a beard can have an impact on your health. Very interesting. I'm intrigued by it. I maybe I was thinking about compensating for my mustache by beards. I'm not sure if I go that route or not. What else is really cool about things we see here? Oh, look at that. A Florida man reportedly used $2 million in virus aid to buy boat. 
I probably would have other things to think about if I got $2 million of govern government money after all. Well, it turns out, oh, interesting. Probably the best Western movie ever made. Well, you see where we are going. I got completely hijacked by all this information. What was the API that I really wanted to explore? Well, exactly the point, as you can imagine. Let's give it a try one more time. Let's bring up Bing and look at it. Oh, what a beautiful island right there. I wonder what this is. And of course, I'm curious to search for it. But what if recursively I get another picture? I'm going to be drawn into it. Let's give it one more try. Let's go search in Google. Well, why do so many people use Google? Well, look at that. There's not a whole lot. It is staring at me and says, search. And what can I search for? Well, what do you want to search for? What if I want to know what are the impact of growing a beard? Well, then search for it. It's not going to be distracting me from the API that I came to look for. Well, the point really is, imagine the day when this developer or engineer went to the team and said, I've designed the UI. And they look at this person and say, show it to us. And here you go. And they look and say, what's there? That's exactly the point. And the person says, you can do the search. Well, gosh, you, you mean just that's it? What, what else is there? And the person says, well, that's why I put I'm feeling lucky. Well, you should. I'm going to say it took courage to do this. Most of us will not have the courage to create something that simple. Don't get me wrong. Behind that button is a slew of complex algorithms, but they did not create the user interface complex for us to deal with it keeps our focus. So I claim that simplicity keeps our focus. That's one of the most important things. As this beautiful quote here says, perfection is achieved not when nothing, there's nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. And so it's a question of asking, what can we remove until the point we cannot remove anything more so we can arrive at something that's really simple? So simple eliminates accidental complexity and hides the inherent complexity. So simple keeps our focus. Well, simple also fails less. If I ask you why the, the cover of the manhole is circle, well, most of us will be able to give the answer, and that is it doesn't fall in. But if I ask you really to design something that doesn't fall in, especially if you're going to really charge a lot for this contract, the chances are all these shapes don't fall in as well. So the point that it doesn't fall in is not the only reason for it. The second reason is it doesn't matter how you roll the circle on top of it. At the end of a very long day, as this person is coming out of that hole, they just need to roll over. They don't have to be aligning it. That's another reason. It fails less. It's not going to fall in. It doesn't take effort to align it or it, you leave it misaligned. You don't have that problem as well. Well, simple is easier to understand, easier to work with, easier to roll over. Now, I was working on a piece of problem. I wanted to really explore the infinite streams uh, a concept. Well, if you're going to find out if a number is a prime number, you could write a code like this. Is prime recursively calls uh, the function to find out the next prime number in the series. But this won't work because it's going to land up with a, a Stack Overflow exception because of extensive recursive calls. But as it turns out, we can use a different technique to write the code, which is that expressive. And that is by using what are called infinite streams in many different languages, including Java. So the streams really give us the ability to evaluate functions lazily. Well, it really intrigued me, the streams API that is, but I really wanted to explore something a little different when I was writing the book on Java 8 functional programming. Well, to lead up to that, I want to talk about elegance and easy to understand, easy to explain as well. Well, I mentioned that simple keeps our focus. Well, simple is also elegant. Now, why is it that this is the most famous picture in the world, famous painting in the world? Well, it's partly or mostly because of the simplicity. 
There is nothing to take away. There is no clutter. There is no ornament. There is no distraction. It is absolutely sheer simplicity that really leads to this famous painting. Well, in that regard, I'll talk about an innovator, uh, architect's dilemma. Well, I was drawn to this particular building in Boston. Well, this was a building that was constructed in Boston downtown, if you ever go there. This building is the church, a Trinity church. Well, this is not the building I'm going to talk about. But this is a church, a beautiful church. But next to this church is a building called the John Hancock Building. Well, I was drawn, mesmerized, looking at this building. I stood there so long that my family decided that if I don't move, they're going to call cops on me. Well, why was I so drawn to that building? Well, it turns out the architect of the building, before the construction, of course, was trying to get the permit to build it, and the city would not give them permission because building that structure there would bring down the beauty of this particular church. Well, the architect challenged and said, when I finish building, it'll be really enhancing the beauty of this church. What did the architect actually do to achieve that? Well, it turns out the architect angled the building in a way that the reflection of the church is on the building. My camera didn't do a good job here personally because when I stood there, I was in awe looking at this building, but more so the reflection of the church on the building. That is pure genius. That's pure simplicity in my opinion to really bring out the beauty of the church by way of the reflection by placing this building in an angle. Well, this is really what I like to do when I write code as well. Make it work and then focus on simplifying it and making it elegant. But simplicity actually takes time to evolve. As Richard Feynman said, if you cannot explain something to a first year student, then you haven't understood it. Oh, talk about not understanding. Let me talk about my own problem of not able to understand something I was creating. Well, Occam's Razor says if you have two solutions, you want to create something that is simple. But the journey is not often easy, as I'm going to explain in this example. I was writing the book on functional programming in Java, Java 8. And as I was writing this book, I really wanted to introduce tail call optimization in this book. Now, we know that Java doesn't have tail call optimization. But I have read other books. I've used a lot of other languages. So, for example, if you take this factorial, which is recursive, it'll lead to Stack Overflow error for a very large value. However, books like Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs and languages like Scala and Clojure and Groovy have shown us that we could actually use tail call optimization. Well, in tail call optimization, a code that is written as recursion is rewritten under the hood as an iteration. So we get the best of both worlds. We can write expressive code using recursion, but never get a stack overflow exception because what actually runs is an iteration under the hood. So having learned about these in good books and seen them in other languages, in the middle of writing the book, I wanted to show how to implement tail call optimization in Java when the Java or the JVM doesn't actually support it. So I wrote a little bit of code as an example. Here's a factorial that is being recursively called. And I spent about 20 hours on that code. Then I spent about 10 hours refactoring it. At the end of 10 hours, what I ended up with was a code along these lines, a tail call class which contains a call function, and the tail call class is really implementing a few methods, but more important, really this method, this particular method is called invoke, which is doing while not call completed, get the current call, invoke it, and get the next call, and then if it's not completed, keep invoking the next one. Well, when I wrote this, it worked, but I looked at this particular function, I was in a bit of a panic because until this point in the book, I kept telling the reader, do not mutate, do not mutate, favor immutability. Well, right there on that line, you can see that I'm actually mutating. How do I fix it? I had no clue. 
But I came up with a brilliant solution, or at least I thought it was brilliant. I wanted to put a little footnote in the book. Dear reader, notice I'm using a while loop and mutability. Well, I leave it as an exercise for you to convert this code to use immutability. Well, that would have worked about 25 years ago. But in today's world of social media and internet, within 10 minutes of the release, people are going to tweet about it and ask me, how do you fix it? Well, okay, that doesn't work. Then I came with a second brilliant answer, a uh, solution. And that was to say, dear reader, notice I'm using mutability. Don't use mutability where you can avoid and use it only as an exception. And I felt really cheap even thinking of that particular suggestion. And I came to a grim realization that my code totally sucks. And I kind of left it alone, went on doing other things. And two days later, I was on the treadmill and slowly my thought was lingering around this. And suddenly I realized, oh my goodness, I can apply the lazy evaluation and infinite stream to implement tail call optimization. Call me silly, but I ran through two floors of my house with the kids screaming, are you okay, daddy? And ran down in 10 minutes, I had a working solution. And that was to convert the invoke function from the while loop to using a stream dot iterate, an infinite stream that would keep getting the next value to evaluate until it finds the first one and stops at that point. No mutability, it was also easier to explain as well. Well, that led me to really rethink about simplicity. Well, as Einstein again says, everything should be simple, made simple as simple as possible, but not any simpler. But the question is, is my code simple or is it still complex? How do we tell? Well, it is simple when I look at it, but when a colleague of mine comes and tells me that I could actually refactor it and make it simpler, what was simple a minute ago became more or a lot more simpler now. Well, which means that it was not really simple. Maybe relatively speaking, it was more complex. So is the solution simple or is it complex? I'm going to say simplicity is Schrodinger's cat. Well, the solution is both simple and complex at the same time, like the poor cat, which is live and dead at the same time. So the point really is we have to work towards creating things simple, but also know that maybe there's a simpler solution to look at. So simple makes things really easy, but it takes a lot of effort to make things actually simple. But it is really worth it for two reasons. One, by making things simple, we made it easier to understand, easier to maintain. But more important to me, that effort you put in to make things simple actually gives us the skill, gives us the ability to attack more complex problems in the future. So when I struggle to make things simple, I always remind myself, your efforts are not just for the problem that you have on hand, it is to really attack similar problems in the future. Over the years, I've gotten better at dealing with complexity because of all those struggles of the past. So as Da Vinci said, that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It is well worth our time. It is well worth our effort to really put up that fight, to put up that struggle and make things simple. And when we do, we can be happy that we created something simple and easier to understand, easier to maintain. We develop the skills to do it, but at the same time, be open for others to help us by way of feedback, maybe to look at this and say, there is yet another simple solution. Let's go strive to make it simpler. So simplicity, as Da Vinci said, is the ultimate sophistication and it is well worth our struggles, our effort to make things really simple. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this was useful. Cheers.